I'd like to introduce Bruce Calvert, who is the Executive Vice President of Richards Apex. He's responsible for the technical activities within the company. Prior to joining Richards Apex in 2011, he was Director of R&D for the Industrial Division of ICI Crota Americas and Department Manager Chemicals Assets for Mobile Oil. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. I hope you're all doing okay during these very difficult times. This talks about water-based lubricants for drawing plated copper, plain copper, and aluminum wire. And we chose lubricity as the topic because it's the key to so many things that operators want most. Quality wire, fewer wire breaks, longer life for dies and capstones. This is the outline for the talk. I'm gonna share with you our conclusions first and then talk about how we arrived at them. Start with a surprising result from a comparison of a water-based lubricant and two need oils. I'll review some basics of lubricated contacts and how we apply those to dyes and capstans. Pardon me why try to progress these slides. So I mentioned some process variables that can overpower lubricant chemistry and talk about selecting base stocks and additives for lubricity. Again, start with the conclusions, compare an interesting result from a water-based lubricant of two need oils, review some basics of lubricated contacts, how they apply to dyes and capstans, mention process variables that can overpower lubricant chemistry, and then talk about selecting base stocks and additives for lubricity. We conclude that the dyes and capstans operate at different ends of the lubrication spectrum. And as a result, a combination of lubricity additives and viscosity provide the best protection. Commonly used anywhear additives rarely help. And the causes of dye wear are well documented, but the fundamentals of capstan wear are still unclear. We used a laboratory test called the Phalex pin and V-block test to compare two neat oils and a dilute emulsion. Now the results have no direct bearing on non-ferrous wire drawing, but it's a very convenient way to make a point this morning. In this test, two steel V-blocks are pressed against a rotating steel pin, and you apply more and more load until the pin breaks. Now the two neat oils were a commercial engine oil and an anywhere hydraulic fluid. This is off the shelf stuff we use every day in the company vehicles. The emulsion was 4% in water, and it's one of our standard non-ferrous wire drawing fluids. The results are shown in this chart. And lo and behold, this pitiful little 4% emulsion far outperformed the engine oil that's in, in orange and the anywhere hydraulic fluid in gray. Now, interestingly, a 3% emulsion was not nearly as good as the 4%, and I'll talk about that in a second. But there are three big takeaways from this. The first is there's a significant effect of concentration. 4% is a lot better than three. And emulsions are capable of working as well as the need oil, and this demonstrates that. And finally, if I didn't tell you that what they were, you might conclude that the engine oil and anywhere hydraulic fluid are actually poor lubricants. Of course, they aren't. They're simply designed for different contact conditions, and so it is with wire drawing fluids. Speaking of contact conditions, the conditions in any lubricated contact, in any application, determines what's needed from the lubricant. The contributing factors are contact pressure, the surface condition, that's in surface roughness, and the sliding speed, that is the relative velocity between these two surfaces. Now, in non-ferrous wire drawing, the contact pressure depends upon the materials, the intended elongation, and the die geometry. And once you nail those down, the pressure is set, except for the effect of the lubricant. And that's important, as I'll point out in a minute. As far as material properties, when I see these non-ferrous metals, tin, copper, silver, and nickel, in contact with ceramic and tungsten carbide and diamond, it reminds me of trying to lubricate ceramic pistons, engine pistons, when they first came out. Conventional additives just didn't work. Now, the majority of work in lubrication science is steel on steel. And these dye materials react very differently. So we as an industry are almost on our own. In order to figure out how best to lubricate these materials, we go back to basics. 
Now the contact conditions translate into lubrication regimes, and there are several, three or four that people talk about that range from full film to boundary. In full film, the viscosity of the oil and the sliding speed drive the formation of a wedge of lubricant, a hydrodynamic film that completely separates the surfaces. Now remember that the viscosity of the oil increases almost 100 times under the pressure in the dye because of the pressure viscosity relationship. At very high pressure, the lubricant films almost act glass-like. In fact, they have limiting shear stress of solid gold. Now in boundary conditions, the asperities of peaks on the surfaces carry most load. That means greater than 90% of loads carried by these peaks. And as a consequence, the resulting friction is about 10 times greater than a full film. A true boundary condition implies very high pressures, much higher than the pressures in non-ferrous wire drawing. So you'd think we'd be operating in mixed regime, but there's a lot of things working against that in non-ferrous wire drawing. In a mixed regime, the asperities poke through a film of lubricant, and the thicker the film, the better the protection. The first machine element I want to talk about is wire being drawn through a die. It's a pure sliding contact. The fast moving wire draws the lubricant at the entrance of the die into the contact. Now Fort Wayne wire die sectioned a die that has took a cutaway. And it did a video of the wire drawing the fluid into the die and it's worth seeing if you haven't already. In the deforming zone, the wire conforms to the surface of the die, which creates a very high contact area, large contact area. Now, between the speed and the, and the conforming surfaces, it's both conducive to film formation. However, there's obviously a lot of sliding friction between the wire and die. And in this case, friction and wear are caused by plowing and abrasion. The asperities are the rough spots, the peaks on the surface of the die plow through the wire and shear off the peaks. As you increase speed, friction increases. Now that's what happens with an abrasive wear mechanism, friction and wear. In friction and wear with adhesion, it's just the opposite. So again, in this case, increasing speed means increased friction. Now in a boundary condition such as this, a smooth die can iron out the peaks on the surface of the wire, giving it that beautiful bright drawn finish. That's actually a very good way of determining whether you're in a boundary condition. Dye is wear because of heat, pressure, and oscillating wire. Heat's considered to be the more damaging than pressure in non-ferrous wire drawing because the pressures are less than they'd be, say, in steel wire drawing. Now, we're often asked what the temperature of the wire is during the drawing process. Roger Wright found that a normal piece of drawn wire must have reached a surface temperature of at least 200 degrees centigrade which is a lot higher than I thought it would be. Now, I mentioned oscillating wire because fatigue failure is the best explanation for the wear ring that forms in the dyes. I wonder if it's also a factor in capstan wear. It would be interesting to see a super slow motion video of the wire dancing on the capstans at the entrance of the die. I used super slow motion video years ago and it gave us insights we never would have gotten without it. This is a chart of speeds and a hypothetical 16 die intermediate wire setup with a final speed of 6,000 feet a minute. So this just assumes a 20.7% one AWG difference at each die. So this reducing the uh, cross-sectional area by 20.7 percent. Again, it's a hypothetical case, and what you see is that the speed increases exponentially. And of course, friction follows the speed. Notice that the wire speed increases by about a thousand feet per minute at each of the last few dies. So between the increased speed, the increased friction, work hardening of the material, and more lineal feet, 
to dyes at one end of this process are operating under very different conditions than the other end. And it's no wonder that the dy downstream dyes wear faster. As I pointed out on the previous slide, the wire speed increased by about 1,000 feet per minute each of the last few dyes. Well, at 5,000 feet per minute, it takes 10 to the minus five seconds for the wire to pass through the deforming zone. And I say in an intermediate wire dye, I'm talking about something with a deforming zone that's several tenths of a millimeter in, in length. Now, because it's such a short distance and the, and the increase is so tremendous, 1,000 feet per minute, Within the deforming zone, the acceleration of the wire is 500,000 meters per second squared. That's actually greater than the acceleration of a bullet in a nine millimeter handgun. And when I step back a second, I think about acceleration. I have a very different mental picture of the conditions in the die. That's a lot of shear on the surface of the wire, the die, and a lot of shear on the lubricant. Now think back for a second to the performance of the 4% emulsion in the phalanx test. The emulsion ran great. In order to get great performance on the emulsion, however, you have to concentrate the oil, capture it, and then pressurize it. You have to concentrate the droplets of synthetic oil or mineral that are dispersed in water where they enter the contact at the end of the dive, for example. Now, there are various theories about how that worked. One's called plate out. Whatever the mechanism, oil has to pool fast enough to keep the dye fed oils. In other words, it has to pool, sorry, it has to pool fast enough to keep up with the rate at which it's drawn into the dye. Otherwise, the contact starved. And this would explain why increasing concentration improves performance in some cases. In other words, if you don't get oil to pool fast enough, increasing the concentration helps a lot. Now remember back again to the phalanx test, very dependent upon the concentration of the emulsion. Now starved dyes may also explain why increasing concentration beyond a certain point doesn't help much. As far as particle size effects, there are two schools of thought. One is that a larger particle size coalesces easier. The other is that a smaller particle size packs more efficiently. What we can say is that we've seen loose and tight emulsions in synthetics all perform well in difficult draws. What you deliver may be more important than how you deliver it. The second machine element I want to talk about is wire on capstans. In contrast to pure sliding in the dies, these contacts are a combination of rolling and sliding. Now, given the number of wraps necessary to get enough traction to draw the wire through the die, the coefficient of friction must be relatively low. As I said at the outset, I'm not sure what causes capstan wear. Empirically, we know that nickel and tin plated copper wire are harder on the capstans than bare copper wire. The fact that tin plated copper is hard on the capstan surprises me since tin itself is two times softer than copper. There must be oxides on the surface of the wire. And if you could prevent, if you could prevent their formation, that is prevent oxidation of that surface, then capstan life should be a lot better. I wanna talk a minute about capstan surface quality. These are SCM photos of two grades of new mag zirconia capstans. There's a significant difference in the grain size and porosity, and I don't know if you can see that in these small images, but they're quite significant, and the grain size and porosity are indicators of wear resistance. As the capstans wear, obviously friction changes, and that changes the requirements or demands on the lubricant and effectively creates a moving target. The first effect of wear is the abrasion of the wire surface and the creation of fines. The second is wire breaks. Now, the best captain's, capstan surface finish today is a roughness average of about one and a half to two micro inches. 
when the RA reaches six to seven, which is when you start to see the grooves, capstans wear much faster. We think pushing viscosity here is very important because the film thickness of the lubricant, in theory, is about the same order of magnitude as the surface roughness. You have to be careful, though, not to create a tacky film that attracts metal particles. Capstan surface quality seems awfully important, but we don't talk about it much and we don't measure it in the plants. I think that's probably a missed opportunity. Now, there are a number of other process variables that affect lubricity and explain why a lubricant may run well in one machine and not in another. An obvious one is the OEM design, the tank size, the slip, the capstan angle, etc. A second is how the lubricant's applied. I think this is a bigger deal than we realize. Third is filtration, which affects three body wear and pack dyes. How the lubricant is replenished. And the amount of air that's mechanically entrained in the fluid. I think about starved dyes when I think about air entrainment. There's also a human factor. And overall process control is very poor, I'm afraid, but it's no one's fault. I want to switch now to talking about engineering lubricants to meet the needs I just mentioned. Formulating starts with the base oils. With mineral oils, we do not see much difference in lubricity between the various types, in part because we use more additives than base oils in our non-ferrous wire drawing products. As for synthetics, most are built on polyalkylene glycols. These are polymers of ethylene oxide and, and, and propylene oxide. And the ones of interest to us are insoluble in water when they reach a certain temperature range. Above what's called the cloud point then, the synthetic solutions look and act like a tight oil water emulsion. Let's just remember that an, an emulsion is just a liquid-liquid dispersion. It doesn't matter whether it's a synthetic base stock or a mineral oil base stock, they form dispersions in water. Now with mineral oils, the editors are key to providing lubricity and you have a lot to choose from. With synthetics, the polyalkylene glycol or the PAG itself may be all that's used. Polyalkylene glycols are decent lubricants by themselves, whereas minerals act more like carrier fluids in this application. Now the next step up in the food chain, the lubricity hierarchy, is friction modifiers or lubricity additives. And I use those terms interchangeably here. There are four or, five, four or five types of friction modifiers, and you can see them here. Organic polymers, organomolybdenum compounds, and dispersed nanoparticles. Now, I won't go through them, but I wanted you to see the field. We use organic and polymeric lubricity as in our non-ferrous wire drawing products. Now, the polymerics are relatively new, and they offer a number of benefits. Organic friction modifiers are long chain surfactants with polar head groups. They're things like acids, esters, and amides. There's something very unique about the carboxylic acid group, uh, whether modified or reacted or not, they all work pretty well. This figure or illustration shows how they were thought to orient on opposing surfaces when the mechanism was first published in 1922. And that was 20 years after G. Whitfield Richards and Company, now Richards Apex, was founded. The theory is that they form tightly packed, non-compressible layers that shear easily. And the key word there from my standpoint is non-compressible. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how these things work and the fact that they're not compressible means, tells me a lot. One of the concerns with organic lubricity additives is how quickly they regenerate as they're worn away. And our thought is you need a thick layer to replenish the surface films fast enough. Now, it all sounds so easy when you see it like this, 
But in fact, very often the reaction products, the degradation products of lubricant act as very good lubricity adders or friction modifiers. Anywhere additives and extreme pressure additives are the next step up the food chain. Anywhere additives are phosphates and dithiophosphate compounds. They're the primary anywhere additives in engine and industrial oils, and they're activated by heat and pressure. EP additives go a step further. They contain things like chlorine, sulfur, and phosphorus compounds. Good examples are chloroparaffins in stainless steel tube drawing or metal cutting and sulfurized isobutylene in gear oils. They're also activated by temperatures and pressures, but higher temperatures and pressures. Now, I have to say that I'd be hard pressed to think of even a few examples of lubricants that don't have these kinds of anywhere and extreme pressure additives as part of them. And yet they're not used much in non-ferrous wire drawing, if at all, because there's not enough pressure to activate them. And even if there was, they don't react the same way they do with steel. Remember back to my comment about ceramic pistons and the fact that conventional additives didn't work. Now, an interesting case study, something sort of proves the point. A neat oil containing an EP additive package that's normally used to draw stainless steel wire was used to draw nickel plated copper wire in a plant. And the upshot of it was that the dye life was no better with a neat oil containing all these. EP additives than one of our standard oil and water emulsions without EP additives. In conclusion, picking the right viscosity building ingredients, almost like viscosifiers, and lubricity additives is the key to formulating for lubricity in non-ferrous wire drawing. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, we have a few questions that came in. Um, how do water-based lubricants work compared to neat oils? Well, that's a very good question. Um, the water-based lubricants, a lot of theories about, it, as I said, about how these things concentrate. So you have to concentrate, capture, and pressurize these lubricants. Uh, the first step is really concentrate, and that's where the trick lies. Uh, the difference is that you have to be able to break down that somehow coalesce those dispersed droplets and then feed the, the contact, uh, the oil rather than the water. Water's a terrible lubricant because there's a very low pressure viscosity coefficient. Here's another question. What do you think about synthetic wire drawing lubricants compared to emulsions? Another great question. In fact, it's, it's a, question that comes up so often, I prepared a backup slide. My answer to that would be they're both great. They're just different. The biggest differences I see is that uh, are that synthetics tend to run clean and they don't split. They can be easier to filter. On the other hand, there are fewer lubricity additives to choose from with synthetics. Fewer levers to pull to get the right lubricity. And for that reason, I'd say a well-engineered oil water emulsion may be more forgiving. Mm -hmm. One of the other Another challenges thing. with synthetics oh, sorry. is uh, how much of the good stuff is remaining in a synthetic solution. Bricks doesn't tell you that. So your concentration of the good stuff can change without you knowing it. And for whatever reason, uh, they hit a wall without any warning. They, they just stop working. Um, but as I said before, they're both great, just different. Okay. Another question, capstan surface quality. What are the small dots on grade B? Porous, porosity. You get these, you get these little pores, the surface just isn't, isn't perfect. And I think that with ceramics, the deal is, you know, it's all in the technology, how you formulate and how you uh, pressurize and, and get the most uniform crystal structure. Okay. And we have one final question. What do you think about synthetic wire drawing lubricants compared to emulsions? 
Well, I thought I answered the question, but I'd say they're both oh, I'm great. Sorry, I'm sorry. The, the other one is, which bench tests do you use to measure lubricity? Ah, bench tests. Uh, we're often asked about bench tests. Uh, you know, many years ago, I actually led a task force at the oil company looking at what the bench test could teach us about engine oil performance, for example. And after nine months, we came up with absolutely nothing. There's not a single test we could think of that would really mimic what was happening in those surfaces. Uh, it, what we find is that there are great bench tests for doing things like foam testing and bioresistance and things like that. Uh, but when it comes to lubricity, we just haven't seen the correlation between the any bench tests and uh, field performance. Now, a really terrific frontline uh, worldwide global producer of wire, wire drawing company, did some excellent work with bench tests, friction and wear, and I think finally gave up, finally threw in the towel. And, and now as far as simulators go, now simulators are great, but they're very dependent upon the scale. And to run a simulator, almost have to run the same scale as a plant. So the bottom line is we think field tests are still the best way to go. Okay. Thank you again, Bruce, for a wonderful presentation. The next one will start in about two minutes. Thank, Thank you. you.